As we move along in the book of Galatians, chapter 6, verse 2, Paul said, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, the whole idea of the book of Galatians is that after Paul had gone to Galatia, had established a church, had witnessed the love of Jesus Christ and the grace of God to these people, and many of them were converted and believed in the Lord. After Paul left, false teachers came in who sought to put Paul down in order that they might build up themselves. And I might say that the worst way in the world to build up your own stock is to tear down somebody else's. And yet there are some people that feel the only way they can build up their own position or stature is by tearing other people down. That's very tragic. But such was the case with these false teachers. They sought to tear Paul down in the eyes of the people in order that they might build themselves up and introduce to these people another gospel. Not the good news of God's grace. But they sought to put the people again under a, relation, a legal relationship with God. Paul had brought these people into a loving relationship with God. God loves you. And because God loves you, he wants to fellowship with you. And thus he has provided for all of your failures and all of your sins through the gift of his son, Jesus Christ who died for your sins, who has made provision for you to stand before God righteous and holy in Christ. Not in the merits of your own labor or efforts, but now solely in the merits of Jesus Christ, you can stand before God. And God, through His grace, will abundantly pardon you all your sin and all to make it possible for you to stand before Him. And Paul was preaching to them this glorious gospel of God's grace, which makes available... To every man, fellowship with God. Now these guys were coming in and saying, Oh, no, no, you can't believe that Paul. He's a renegade. He's not really authorized. Who ordained him? He's just sort of a self-ordained fellow. The real truth is that you've got to keep the law. You've got to be circumcised. You've got to keep the law of Moses if you want to be righteous before God. And so they introduced the righteousness by works, the works of the law. And so Paul is writing to the Galatians to correct the false teaching. You see, these men had put upon the church of Galatia a heavy burden of the law. Laid on them this heavy burden. Now, when in Jerusalem the church gathered to determine what relationship the Gentile believers should have to the law... Peter, in testifying how God had called him to the Gentiles, suggested that they not lay on the Gentiles the yoke of bondage that neither we nor our fathers were able to bear. Don't lay on them this heavy burden of the law, this yoke of bondage. We nor our fathers were able to bear it. Why should we lay it on the church, the, the Gentile believers? And so when the church wrote to the church in Jerusalem, the church fathers wrote to the church, the Gentile church of Antioch, concerning their relationship to the law, they said that we lay upon you no other burden than. And so they, they laid upon them the burden of uh, keep yourself from fornication and things that are offered to idols. And if you do this, you do well. But they said no other burden. Now, these People, these false teachers had come to Galatia and had laid upon these people the heavy burden of the law. And if you try to keep the law, you'll find out what a heavy burden it really is. And especially if you seek to be made righteous before God by your adherence to the law, you'll find that you've got an impossible situation. Not only that, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in God's sight. So the law was given to give us the knowledge of sin. After it did that, it can't really do anything else. So bear ye one another's burdens. Now, instead of laying burdens on people, 
going around and laying heavy trips on people. Go around and lift one another's burdens. Just the opposite of what these teachers had done. They'd come in and laid heavy burdens on them. Paul said, oh no. Go around and lift the burdens of others. Bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. Now you have the Mosaic law, and then you have the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? A new commandment, he said, give I unto you. Oh. Just a minute, we've got a new commandment. The 11th commandment. What is it? Love one another. You say, oh, that's easy. Wait a minute. No, it isn't. In all cases. Some cases it's easy. Some cases it's extremely difficult. But that is the law of Christ. That we are to love one another. And in love. We are looking out for one another. We are helping one another. We are lifting one another. Now, Paul has just dealt with the, the fact that if a brother be overtaken or slips, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. And then he says, bear one another's burdens rather than laying burdens on people. Help people who are burdened. And thus you are fulfilling the law of Christ. Now, the whole law is comprehended, Paul said, in one statement that we love one another. That's the whole law. When the scribe came to Jesus and said, which is the greatest commandment? Jesus said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. And in these two are all the law and the prophets encompassed. This is, this is the whole thing. So bear one another's burdens. Lift one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Now, have you ever met a person who thought he was something, who was really nothing? <laughs> what self-deception that is. And, and the tragic thing about self-deception, when a person has deceived himself, puffed up, really think, well, I'm really somebody, I'm really important, I'm really... And, and a person has deceived himself, they are the hardest people in the world to reach. Now, Paul speaks elsewhere of people thinking more highly of themselves than they ought. Let no man think, he said, more highly of himself than he ought to think, but rather think soberly. It's so easy for us to get puffed up. And you know, one of the most Dangerous areas of being puffed up is in the spiritual areas to be puffed up with spiritual pride. Especially when God has used you. Now, whenever God uses us, we try to figure out, well, why did God use me? <laughs> well, he used me because, you see, he knew... <laughs> that I could handle it, you know. And <laughs> but it is always your spiritual walk is in danger whenever God uses you. It is interesting that Paul makes this statement in Romans, the 12th chapter, as a preface to his teaching on spiritual gifts and the exercise of spiritual gifts. Before he talks about the, the gifts of the Spirit upon an individual and the use of the gifts by an individual, he says, Therefore, let no man think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but let him think soberly. Whenever a person has received certain spiritual gifts or is used of God in a spiritual way, man always seems to seek to elevate that person. 
to hold him up in high esteem. Now, the danger is that if you begin to accept the praise of man, you begin to look for that recognition, you begin to expect people to, you know, do special little favors because after all, look who I am kind of a thing, you know. You know, you can carry my suitcase or, you know, you start expecting people to give you special favored treatment. Oh, how sad. How sad that in the church we have set up certain individuals as, you know, um, oh, but he is, you know, to do. <laughs> oh, I saw him the other day, you know, in the restaurant. He eats. <laughs> when Peter was heading into the temple to pray, a man who had been lame from his birth, who was a beggar, sought alms. And Peter called to the man and said, Hey, look at me. And the fellow turned, expecting to receive something, holding out his hand. Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold, but what I have I'll be glad to share. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand to your feet and walk. And Peter took him by the right hand and lifted him to his feet, and immediately he received strength in his ankles. And the man began to walk and leap and praise God. And he went through the temple, walking, leaping, praising God came back out onto the court or the porch there where Peter was standing, followed by a great multitude of people who had known this man, who had seen him begging. Isn't that the mayor? Yeah, that's him. But sure looks like him. What's he doing running around here? I don't know. Let's find out. And so they all followed back out to Solomon's porch, greatly wondering, what in the world's going on? This beggar that we've watched for years is running around the place. What's happened? And he probably grabbed hold of Peter and jumped up and down and was squealing for joy so that the people began to relate Peter to the miracle. And Peter said, hey, wait a minute. Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look upon us as though we through our own righteousness have done this glorious deed to this lame man? Hey, be it known unto you that it's by the name of Jesus Christ that this man is standing here before you whole and by the faith of him. You see, immediately they were trying to elevate Peter, trying to make the Pope out of him. <laughs> Peter refused. He didn't want the honor of man. He didn't want to be standing there receiving the glory of man. He didn't want man looking at him as though he was some holy saint because he knew he wasn't a holy saint. He knew he was just a man like everybody else. Now, there are a lot of people deceive themselves. They think they're holy saints. They think they're no longer men. They think they're no longer human. They walk around in a spiritual kind of a bubble and they want everybody to do penance before them or bow before them as they come. Not so. It's a self-deception when you begin to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Begin to think that you're really something. Well, I'm God's special instrument. I'm God's special man. I'm God's... Oh. <laughs> but God spoke through me. Well, isn't that glorious? He also spoke through Balaam's ass. And we need to remember that. <laughs> Lest I think I'm something special because God spoke through me. I had a revelation. So easy for men to get into this area of self-deception. James speaks about men who have deceived themselves. Those who 
are hearers of the word and not doers. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, he said, deceiving yourselves. And then John tells us that if any man says he has not sinned, he has no sin, he deceives himself. So anytime you think you're really righteous, you're really holy, you're some special saint, you've just deceived yourself. And you've got to be careful of this self-deception because if you've deceived yourself, then how are you going to learn any better? There you are. You're self-deceived. And, and people try to tell you, or, or you know, how are you going to learn any different? What a tragic thing this self-deception is. Now in 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, Paul said, What do you have but what you have received? And that is, of anything worthwhile in your life at all, if there is any good, if there is any value, if there is any merit, where did it come from? Well, it came from God. Any good thing that may come out of my life has come from God. It, it doesn't originate with me. All right, if I have received it, then why am I boasting as though I didn't receive it, Paul said. You see, if what you have has come to you from God, then how is it that you're so puffed up as though it didn't come from God, as though it were you or something that is in you or special with you? So the injunction to us, if any man thinks more highly of himself than he ought, he is self-deceived, he deceiveth himself. But let every man test or prove his own work. And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not of another. Now, Paul is talking about the, the works that you do for the Lord. Put them to the test. It may be very revealing if, if you can be honest with yourself. Why did I help that little old lady across the street? Well, because I saw some people that I knew and I wanted to impress them with my humility. I mean, what is the motive? You know, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, the Lord said. Who can know it? And the Bible says, let a man examine himself, for if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged of God. And there are a lot of things that man does that on the surface look beautiful and magnanimous. But when you begin to really probe your own heart, when you really begin to probe yourself, you'll find that many times underneath there is motivation other than what is honorable and good. The motivation is really many times for my own glory, that people might recognize me, that I might be known. The vain glory of man is such a powerful motivator even to many wonderful good works. Therefore, you need to test yourself in order that you might have rejoicing of yourself and not of another. In other words, he is saying that judge your work not in comparison to somebody else. Well, I gave more than he did. Well, I did more than he did. But really, let your judgment be what you might have done really had you done your best. Because it seems that no matter what we have done for the Lord, we always could have done more. It never was the ideal, you see. Judge yourself with, with your own ideals, not with other men. Jesus spoke of the error of the Pharisees in comparing themselves with man. You do err, he said, because you're making your comparison with men. So you think you're so righteous. Why do you think you're so righteous? Oh, because... Uh, you know, your neighbor is a boozer and your other neighbor is into drugs and your other neighbor is into fornication. So that makes you very righteous. 
because all you are is a thief and a cheat. (laughs) And he is doing worse things than you. So your standard of comparison is the wrong standard. If you want to know the righteousness that God accepts, then you've got to look at Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit, Jesus said, will testify to the world of righteousness because he said, I ascend to my Father. What in the world does he mean by that? Just this. The ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven. As he was standing with his disciples there at Bethany and he ascended into heaven in their sight. And they stood there gazing up as a cloud received him out of their sight. That was God's witness to the world. Here is the righteousness that I will accept into the kingdom. God's testimony to the world. The ascension of Jesus Christ was testifying that God received his righteousness. This is the standard. All right, so you want God to receive you? All you have to do is be as righteous as Jesus. And God will receive you. You say, but I can't. No way. Well then, there's one, only one other way God will receive you. And that is to believe in Jesus. And his righteousness is then imputed to your account. But you see, we are trying to establish a standard of righteousness by which we are comparing ourselves with others. But in comparing ourselves with others, we're making one fatal mistake. And that is, God won't accept the righteous standard of the other guy either. There's only one righteous standard that God will accept, and that is the righteousness of His only Son, Jesus Christ. And his ascension into heaven is the proof that this is the righteous standard that God will accept. And the Holy Spirit will testify to the world of righteousness, Jesus said, because I ascend to the Father. So the only hope any of us have of being accepted by God is by accepting Jesus Christ. And by believing in him, God imputing then to us the righteousness which is of Christ through faith. But what does that do? All of a sudden it puts us all on the very same level. Has God accepted you, brother? Yes. Why? Well, because I believe in Jesus Christ. Well, all right. Because you're so good? Oh, no. Because you're so holy? Because you've done so much work? Oh, no. Because you've paid your tithes and gone to church and done the righteous thing? Oh, no. God is accepting you premised upon your faith in Jesus Christ. And that's the only way God will accept you. Otherwise, you're rejected just like everybody else. Now, that's the same basis that God has accepted me. So, my boasting is eliminated. I can't go around and say, well, it's because I'm so good or God saw the potential in me or or any of these kind of things. God saw that I was helplessly and hopelessly lost and he felt so sorry for me. He knew there was no way I could make it. And he saw me in my desperate condition and in love he reached down and he lifted me out of the horrible pit and out of the miry clay and he set my feet upon the rock and he established my goings. Now, that means... That God has accepted me, God has accepted you on the same basis. Not on our works, not on our righteousness, but on the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which he's imputed to us by faith. Therefore, you're not more righteous than I am, neither am I more righteous than you. We are all standing on the same footing. Therefore, I'm not above you. We're on the same footing when we stand before God. It's an equalizer. Every man stands before God on the very same footing of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we don't elevate or exalt man or any man. You're no more of a saint than I am. God accepts us all through His mercy and grace. 
in Jesus Christ. Therefore, as Paul said, let us test and prove our own work, and then we shall have rejoicing. <laughs> the rejoicing is really in myself for what God has done for me. Oh, thank you, Lord, <laughs> for reaching down and helping me when I was in my hopeless state. Thank you, Lord, for lifting me out of that horrible pit. Thank you, Lord, for making me your child. And the cause of rejoicing is in him. It isn't that, oh, I'm done more or I'm superior to someone else. God has been merciful to me, a sinner. For every man shall bear his own burden. Now, wait a minute, Paul. Aren't you confusing things? A little bit ago you told us to bear one another's burdens, and now you're telling us every man should bear his own burden. First of all, I'd like to point out that in the Greek there are two different words used for burden. The one that is used in verse 2 is related in other uses in the New Testament to the law, as I said in Acts, the 15th chapter, when they sought to instruct the Gentile churches, its relationship to the law, that we lay upon them no other burden. Same uh, barrios, a Greek word is used. But this particular Greek word that is used here in verse 5, for every man shall bear his own burden, is the word that they use for the um, backpack. Say you're going backpacking. Every man has to carry his own backpack. Everyone has to carry his own weight. Let each one carry his own weight, for every man shall bear his own pack or his own weight. Now Paul instructs us in verse 6, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good Things. Now, I don't like to amplify on this particular verse because it would appear to be self seeking. Because I am the teacher, and it says that they that are taught in the word should communicate unto him who teaches in all good things. So I appreciate the peaches and apricots and all that you bring in, and, uh, and that's great. Uh, it's proper according to this particular verse. And, uh, and Paul is talking about really what we do owe to those who teach and instruct us in the Word of God. But as I say, I don't like to amplify it because I, I, I would like to say that God has so marvelously blessed us and supplied all of our needs and met all of our needs and and I, I don't want to ever be at all in the light or position like I am trying to butter people up that they might do favors for me. I don't need favors. I'm really not here to be ministered to. That's never been my object in the ministry is, is, is to have people minister to me. I, that, that's, that's not, that is actually inconsistent with the term minister. The term minister really is another word for servant. And, and I am here to serve. I'm not here to be ministered to. I am here to minister. I am as your minister here. That is, as your servant here, I've come to serve you. It just becomes a little burdensome when there's too, so many to serve. It is a lot easier to minister to a church of a hundred people or so. Uh, because you can become more involved in the people's lives in a personal way, which does have its value. But our view of the ministry has never been to have people to minister to us. In fact, probably to a fault. But uh, my wife Kay shares this with me. We are, we're very embarrassed many times when people try to do nice things for us. We appreciate the things that are done, but many times it embarrasses us. 
nothing embarrasses me more than, than to go and speak someplace and have uh, some pastor get up and say, now we want to receive an offering tonight for Brother Chuck because he's come a long way and he's, you know, has these expenses, all this kind of stuff. And, and they start laying these, these things on people. And I'm sitting there as the guy is, is pumping the people f- for an offering for me. That is the most embarrassing thing in the world. And I have an understanding now, after it's happened to me a few times, I have an understanding that whenever I go to speak anywhere, they don't take any offerings for me. In fact, the last time that happened was in Hawaii, when I had gone to uh, speak there, and the guy got up and started telling the people, you know, we want to take an offering for Brother Chuck and all this kind of stuff. And I got up and I said, Brother Chuck isn't going to receive a dime from you people. Because I'm not here to receive from you, I'm here to give to you. So you give what you want to for the work of this ministry here, whatever God lays on your heart to give to, but don't think you're giving to me because I'm not going to let you give to me. I've paid my own plane tickets and I'm not going to take a dime. I was so embarrassed because, you see, I'm employed by the Lord and He pays me very well. And, and I don't like the poor mouthing that you so often hear as, as people are dealing in the areas of giving and all. So, <laughs> a few years ago, as we were going through the Bible, we came to the book of Malachi and I was attracted to that verse where it said, And they that love the Lord spake often of him one to another, and God listened and made a record, and they shall be accounted as his jewels when he makes up his kingdom. And I thought, Oh, that's exciting. Whenever you get together and talk about the Lord, he's always eavesdropping. What do you got to say about me, you know? (laughs) He takes note. He makes a record of it. And those people who, who love to get together, and really, it's so beautiful to get together with people who love to talk about the Lord. It's so much fun to just talk about the things of the Lord and the goodness of God when we get together. And God is eavesdropping, making a record of it, and He is counting them as His jewels, you know, and when He makes up His kingdom and all. And, and I was attracted to that and started to prepare my message on that particular verse. And the Spirit spoke very strong to my heart and said, Why are you robbing the people? And I said, Now wait a minute, Lord. There is one area where I have tried to be just completely and totally above reproach. And that is in the area of the people's giving. Never to ask. Never to beg. Never to pressure people in special offerings or or this kind of a thing to, to... make people feel pressured or coerced in giving to God. I am violently opposed to all of these money-raising gimmicks that are employed by the church and parachurch organizations. And Lord, you know that this is the area where, you know, I've made such a strong stand. And the Lord spoke to my heart very strongly and said, Yes, you've made too strong a stand. For many of those people do not know the blessing of giving to me. And I thought about that. And that scripture in Malachi, Will a man rob God? But you say, Wherein if we rob God? God said in tithes and offerings, 
Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord, and see I, if I will not pour out unto you a blessing that you cannot contain. And he said, you've been robbing the people of the blessings that they would receive if they would give to me. And so I preached a sermon on tithing once. <laughs> because I didn't want to rob you of the blessings, because there is a truth here. There is a spiritual principle involved, a spiritual law. And, and I didn't want to be guilty of, of robbing you of the blessings that do come to a person who gives to God from a happy heart and willingly, that willing, happy giving to God which all of our giving should be. So it's an area that I am very sensitive about because I feel that this is one of the areas that in the church has been abused so terribly. And I see so much abuse as far as money-raising techniques within the church that uh, I have actually swung the other way in the pendulum of really just not wanting to take from people. And yet, the Lord said, but you're robbing them of the blessing. I laid it upon their heart to give to you. And now you're robbing them of the blessing because you're refusing to take it. So I've learned to receive so that I don't rob you of the blessing. Not that I have any need. As Paul said, I thank you for the gift that you sent to me, not that I needed it, but I desire that fruit might abound to your account. So you see, the investment that they had made in Paul's ministry, the fruit that was coming to Paul's ministry was being put in the heavenly accounting system to the accounts of those that were supporting Paul in his ministry. I wish Paul were still around so I could invest a few bucks in that guy. He was really very fruitful for the Lord. <laughs> so, I don't want to belabor that scripture, but you pray about it and look it over and God will speak to you on it. Well, we've come to the area where I want to really spend some time and we don't have that kind of time this evening. So we'll put off this next verse until next Thursday night. But I think, again, we are involved now with the very basic principles of, <laughs> of our Christian walk and experience. Uh, he's talking about those who have been deceived, thinking more highly of themselves than they ought to be thinking, thinking themselves to be something when they are really nothing. And now another area of deceit, thinking you can put something over on God. Oh, any man who thinks he's putting it over on God has really deceived himself. But you see, this comes from the fact that we're able to snow people. And because we're able to put up a front in, before people and they say, Oh my, isn't he wonderful? And you know good and well yourself that you're not. But you like them to think that of you, so you let them go on thinking it and you do little things in front of them so they'll continue to think it. And you become so clever and so adept at putting on this good show before men that you think you can do the same thing to God and you've got God fooled. No way. We'll get into this next week as we deal with this very important thing of sowing and reaping. It's a law of life in nature and in the supernatural that you can't get away from. One of the most important lessons of the book of Galatians coming up next Thursday night, sowing and reaping. Father, we thank you for the instructions that we receive from your word. And Lord, help us, help us, God, that we might see ourselves as you see us, Lord. Help us not to be deceived. But Lord, may we really, in love, serve one another and keep the spirit of a servant, Lord, not as lords ruling over the flock of God or seeking to 
be exalted above others. But Lord, all of us down in the pits together, laboring for Thee side by side, helping one another, bearing one another's burdens, walking in Thy love, encouraging and lifting those that are weak, those that fall, those that stumble. O oh Lord, that we might indeed be the servants of God, doing thy work. In Jesus' name, amen.